I appreciate the uh, invitation to, to join today and for Lou and Parsha for setting this up. We've been working with families who have been affected by acute flaccid myelitis and transverse myelitis for years uh, in the States and it's been great to talk with colleagues and, and now with you to get a sense of what you've been experiencing. I'll try to go through to give you uh, a high level uh, view of what we've been doing in, in the States but I'm also very interested to leave time to hear from you and, and what you've experienced. Um, and so I, I just wanted to set up what, what the goals are, what I want to achieve with this. And at any time, feel free to interrupt, ask a question. If I need to clarify something, I'm, I'm happy to do so. So first is to give you our sense of exactly what is this condition? What are we seeing? And then to talk about, as been a big topic, what the causes are. Uh, I do want to give a sense of how we're treating things acutely in the States when, when a child's acutely ill, something that you're past. Um, but as we tell, work with families in the States, uh, you become the ambassadors for, unfortunately, the next group of families who are, are going to go through this because we're not done, unfortunately. And you're often the first point of contact uh, in the acute setting. And so we like to go over what we're doing and I'll uh, talk about what's controversial relative to those therapies. Um, I'll give you a sense of the outcomes that we're seeing in the States. We're a few years ahead, not in terms of knowledge, but in terms of outbreaks. And so we have kids a little further out and can give you a sense over time of, of what we're seeing. And I'll very briefly talk about what we're doing relative to therapy. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. I, I enjoyed uh, chatting uh, with colleagues here to get a sense of the different approaches. Nobody has a right answer yet. There are a variety of answers, and I'll give you a sense of what those are, and then briefly talk about where our research is going. So the first thing is to put this into context. So it's, it's Saturday morning. You either had tea or coffee. It's not even 9.30 yet, and we're going to talk about anatomy. And so uh, I apologize in advance. Um, but it actually turns out for everything we're discussing, what is AFM, how do you treat it, what's the rehabilitation, what's the research, this is the most important concept to have in your mind because it allows us to start making sense of what we're seeing and what we're recommending. So everybody has a spinal cord. Uh, it connects the brain to the rest of the body and it's housed in the spine, in the bones. It's actually a very small piece of tissue. It's, it's only a couple centimeters uh, across, a few centimeters across, and yet it controls every signal going into the brain or going out of the brain. And when we look at the connection between the spinal cord and the muscles, um, I'm going to come back to this at the end, but just to set the stage, the motor system has two connections. I very scientifically refer to it as wire number one and wire number two. So wire number one goes from the brain down into the spinal cord where it connects with wire number two, which then leaves the spinal cord and goes to the muscle. If I cut wire number one or wire number two, you will have weakness. You will have an inability to volitionally move a limb, but the pattern of weakness is completely different. When you cut wire number one, you'd have difficulty moving a limb, but the limb would get tight and it would get spastic because wire number two is still connected, but it's been disconnected from the brain, so it just throws a party. It just sends signals to the muscle and the muscle just gets tight. When you cut wire number two, the muscle is left on its own. It's disconnected from everything, and that's when it gets loose or flaccid and weak. So the difference between a flaccid weakness and a uh, tight weakness is where the damage occurs. Is it wire number one or wire number two? Now within the spinal cord, wire number one is in the center of the cord, that dark gray on this picture towards the front, what we refer to as the anterior horn, and that's where wire number two begins. So, so the command and control center for wire number two is in that very center, front center of the cord, and then sends its wire out to the muscle. Wire number one, the one that's going up and down, going from the brain down, lives off to the side in what we refer to as the white matter of the cord. So you have a wire going from the brain down the cord, off to the side, until it gets to its target, it, the wire number two it's supposed to connect to. It connects right there, and then wire number two leaves the cord and goes out to the muscle. And so wire number two, that very beginning, is only in the cord for a few millimeters, a very small section before it leaves, uh, but the command and control center is there. Is everybody comfortable with that wire number one, wire number two? So it's amazing how uh, forgetting the difference between the two led to us 
not recognizing this condition as early as it started. Uh, and I was guilty of it as well. And so getting back to the basic anatomy is, is important for, for us on the clinical side. So just to highlight, I'm gonna give you a short tour of the spinal cord. Uh, so you, you had a tour of Burkdale, the coffee's over there, the loo, I'm picking up on appropriate vocabulary, is over there. <laughs> In the spinal cord, the very front and the very back are sensory fibers. So sensations around temperature, around pain, around knowing where your joints are, what's called proprioception, uh, travel in the front and back of the cord. They're separated into their distinct areas. And so if you get damage to one of those areas, you or your child would say from this level somewhere on them and below, they have a loss or a change in sensation. So if a patient ever comes in and says, Dr. Greenberg, from here down, I can't feel, then it's the very back or the very front of the cord affecting the sensory fibers. When you go off to the sides of the spinal cord, that's where wire number one for the motor system is. So if you damage the sides of the spinal cord, you will get weakness of whatever limbs it was projecting to, but it will be that tight weakness. And then the gray matter, the anterior horns of the cord are right there, and that's where the very beginning of wire number two is. So when patients come in with a variety of different symptoms, without an MRI, without a spinal tap, without blood work, with questions, a reflex hammer, and a couple other tools, any neurologist should be able to tell you exactly where in the cord an issue is. Now, it's not always that precise. Sometimes we get a little surprised, but for the most part, we should be able to localize where in the body the problem is. So the way I got into acute flaccid myelitis was via this term transverse myelitis. And uh, how many of you were, had children who were initially diagnosed as transverse myelitis? So uh, this, this is a common terminology. Um, it has caused a lot of problems in the field. There's a lot of confusion over what's the relationship and what's the right diagnosis. And so what I'd like to do is walk you through transverse myelitis the way I was taught uh, in terms of how to conceptualize this, because hopefully it will, will help. So what I was taught was transverse myelitis was the white matter of the cord. So that you had a spinal cord that had the gray matter in the center, the white matter around, and remember that white matter are the sensory signals going up to the brain and then those wire number ones coming down. Yes? You mentioned that the gray matter was where the, uh, the junction is with wire yes. number two and everything else seems to be in the white matter. What's in the gray matter above that junction? So stacked up, so if we go back to this picture, so this cord is gray matter just stacked on top of each other and each of those gray matter areas are going to different muscles. And so all that's in the gray matter up and oh, down. So it's like sections. So it's sections. Your arms and your legs and the, so it, you make it look like one point, but in fact it is. And that becomes extremely important relative to rehab. So it's an excellent, excellent question. So if I isolate my biceps muscle, it is fed by actually multiple levels, several inches of gray matter up and down. And it's usually in a um, cigar shape where the, the, the center of it was say two inches high of cells feeding the biceps. Most of them are in the center. And as you go out, there are less and less cells heading to the biceps because it's not a one-to-one. -one. There isn't one wire at one level going to the biceps because you do a lot of different things with your biceps. And so in order to control it in a lot of different ways, there's hundreds of thousands of cells going to the biceps, all arranged up and down. Okay. And then as you move from the middle of the cord to the outside of the gray matter, excuse me, the middle of the gray matter to the outside, you control different parts of muscles. You get clusters of cells for different functions, meaning are you going to extend the arm or flex the arm? They, they sit in clusters throughout the gray matter. So even within the gray matter, the cells have an arrangement up and down and side to side. Um, but all that's in the gray matter, the anterior gray matter, are those wire number twos. Okay. And so um, the way I was taught was in transverse myelitis, uh, you had inflammation. So what this is is actually a section from, from years ago, an, an autopsy specimen uh, from an adult who had had transverse myelitis and passed away for an un, unrelated reason. 
And what they found were these little blue dots all throughout the white matter. And each of those blue dots are cells from the immune system. So they were cells that had left the blood supply, gone into the white matter, and caused damage. Now, the, the term white matter, those wires, the white matter refers to the myelin around the axon. So for each of the wires, wire number one coming down from the brain and wire number two going from the spinal cord to the muscle, it's just like wiring of a microphone or wiring to a computer or a plug for a lamp. There's the copper wire on the inside and then insulation around it. And we give the insulation the fancy term myelin. It makes it sound a lot smarter than just saying insulation. So in transverse myelitis, the theory was, and the dogma was, that the immune system gets confused, goes into the white matter of the cord, and causes demyelination, loss of the myelin. And if you strip the myelin from <clears throat> a wire, then the signal can't get through. Just like if I were to fray the insulation around a plug of a lamp, the lamp might not work as well. Yeah. Is that the same as Guillain-Barre? So in Guillain-Barre, you lose the, the myelin around wire number two. So uh, a lot of times, uh, so if, I, if we were to split uh, the kids in our cohorts who have had acute flaccid myelitis, if they were misdiagnosed, they often were told they had Guillain-Barre. Because it is a problem with wire number two, but it's a different problem. It's out in the periphery after it's left the cord versus the problem being in the cord in those first few millimeters of wire number two. Okay. So when we have uh, patients who show up, kids or adults who show up with inflammation in the spinal cord, if it's affecting wire number one or wire number two, they're going to have weakness. Uh, so it looks very similar. And we were told in this situation uh, that our goal was to put the fire out. So for every moment that that inflammation was left in the cord, there was damage happening. And at a high level, there were three types of damage happening. So first off, it turns out that if your immune system enters the spinal cord, just, even without causing damage, just the cells being present causes dysfunction of the spinal cord. So you're gonna have some symptoms just from the inflammation being there. But if you leave the inflammation long enough, the way I was taught was it would lead to loss of that insulation around the wiring. And if the inflammation was there long enough yet still, it would lead to the wires being cut. And as you can imagine, this dictates how reversible a symptom is. So if somebody comes in with weakness and numbness, but they haven't had any demyelination or any cut axons, if I treat them, all their symptoms go away. They have 100% recovery, usually within a couple of weeks, uh, and are doing just fine because we got rid of the inflammation, because we're very good at getting rid of inflammation. If they've had some damage to the myelin, then it takes longer. Your body grows new myelin. You will remyelinate. It's not as good as the original, but it does it. So this is the improvement that we see over months, even years afterwards. But once you cut the wires of wire number one, the to our knowledge, the only way to recover is through plasticity. In order to take wires that are intact and teach them to do the jobs of the ones that are lost. Now that's for wire number one. We're gonna talk about wire number two differently. So I was taught that there were a lot of therapies uh, to use in transverse myelitis. There was steroids. How many of your children got steroids, okay? There was a therapy, I, what is it? Just keep my hand up. Okay. <laughs> three out of those. <laughs> Uh, IVIG, show of hands, okay. Plasmapheresis, okay, all three? Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, cyclophosphamide, cytoxin, yeah. So that, that's an older drug that's been used in transverse myelitis for years. I'm not gonna be talking about it at all today, but the way, so this section of the talk is the way I was taught. So this is how I was taught, that if somebody has inflammation of the cord, I've got a lot of different fire extinguishers I can use to put the fire out, and depending on what institution you're at, you might get one, the other, uh, all three or four. And so when we looked at this in the setting of transverse myelitis, this predates acute flaccid myelitis outbreaks, okay? Um, we looked back to decide what was the impact of these different therapies. And we used a scale, it's a zero to 10 scale. If you're uh, a seven or eight on the scale, it means you're using a wheelchair. If you're a six, you're using a walker. Five, you're using a cane four or less you're walking independently. And we looked at over 100 patients who had been treated for transverse myelitis and we said, what was the impact of these different therapies? And everybody in the group started off in a wheelchair, uh, so acutely. This is 
being admitted to the hospital, unable to walk, unable to stand. If they were to get around, it would be a wheelchair. And for the, the individuals who just got steroids and nothing else, uh, we changed them on two points on the scale. So they went from an eight to a six or a seven to a five. So that means getting out of a wheelchair and walking, which is a huge deal. I mean, that's a life-changing event. But when we added plasmapheresis, we doubled that number. We took people who are wheelchair bound and shifted them to walking independently without a cane. And so we were a big believer in the more anti-inflammatories you use, the better your patients are going to be. And so it was with this background, I refer to it as my neurological upbringing. This is the way I was taught that I was then faced with acute flaccid myelitis. And a lot of the issues early on with acute flaccid myelitis were actually cognitive issues on the part of the healthcare team because I didn't grow up with polio. I had never seen a case of acute polio. I had never seen people come in with this pattern of weakness. So when I started seeing my first cases, I actually didn't put them into the right construct. And in the US, the first discussions around acute flaccid myelitis happened in 2012 at the public health level. There were a couple reports of individuals with uh, acute flaccid paralysis and uh, people were worried that it was polio. And they had done polio testing, couldn't find it, uh, but they did find some that were positive for this unusual enterovirus. Carol Glazer uh, in the California State Health Department contacted our Centers for Disease Control to said, you really should investigate this and the CDC said no, no thanks, uh, that there wasn't enough to go on. And we didn't really see much uh, in 2013. When we looked back, uh, so I moved to Texas in 2009. January 1st, 2009 was my first, first day there. I moved from Baltimore to Texas uh, and was seeing kids. And I was seeing kids in, t in 2009 that were just a little different than the usual transverse myelitis kids. And I get to 2013, uh, and one of my fellows, I'm having a conversation about transverse myelitis with him, this is, we were talking last night, Alan DeSena, pointed out that the way I was teaching transverse myelitis didn't appear to apply to all the kids. We had some kids where it wasn't just wire number one. And I said, yeah, you know, you're, you're right, and that is unusual. So we put together a paper, which was a horribly titled paper, Transverse Myelitis Plus Syndrome. And I, I use this as a, a teaching tool for my students and residents this shows how cognitively uh, narrow-minded I was. I, my brain couldn't handle something different. So I had to put it into the box I knew and then just add plus syndrome, which is ridiculous. It's absolutely insanity. Uh, most embarrassing paper I've ever written. Um, so this gets published in uh, May of 2014. And then it is literally just after that that there's an outbreak in the United States that gets recognized in Colorado uh, and further. So Colorado reported a cluster of eight cases uh, in July, August of 2014. And in the U.S., it was actually one of the most reassuring moments in my uh, professional career. We were getting these reports, getting these reports through September and talking with the CDC. And on a Tuesday we, from UT, we sent out an email to colleagues around North America saying on Thursday at midnight Eastern time, 1130 Eastern time, we're getting on a call just to hear what everyone's experiencing. And there were over 30 centers on the call nationwide from, from one email. And the call was fascinating. We were all seeing the same things at the same time. And this would have, none of it was being reported to public health um, because everybody was just seeing one. But when you put it all together nationally, it was a much bigger number in the pattern emerged. But if you're in a hospital and you've got 20 patients and only one has this unusual variant, it has no context for you until you connect the dots. And it was on that call that we all agreed to use the term acute flaccid myelitis because before then there were six different terms being used by individuals communicating with each other. And so if I said, does anyone have a case of acute flaccid myelitis? They'd say, no, but I have an acute flaccid paralysis. I'd say, well, that sounds close enough. Let's compare. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the literature going back over 100 years, there's been over 25 different terms used to describe the exact same thing. And so even when you go to the literature, we don't have a sense of how comprehensive this illness has been over the years because it's hidden behind different names. So on that call, we talked about what we were seeing. And this is, this is what we've seen very consistently in the United States. So it's similar to polio in the following way. One is the flaccid weakness, which we talked about, wire number two, in one or more limbs. 
The symptoms can evolve over hours. It can be very quick. Children can go from normal to a complete flaccid paresis within three to six hours. And uh, that's um, very unusual to uh, what we're used to seeing in other spinal cord inflammatory disorders, or it can take days. Often there was a preceding fever or respiratory symptoms in the weeks beforehand. A third of our kids required a ventilator at some point during their care. And the MRI, the imaging of the cord, revealed that the gray matter, which is those uh, anterior horn cells, the wire number two, we could see clear signal change. And as we were comparing notes, we were all seeing the exact same thing across these 30 sites. And so that's when things got organized. Um, the CDC in the US had, had just launched their surveillance, and we started collecting data on a nationwide level. And so if you look at the communication between physicians, and I'll, I'll let you all read this. When uh, clinicians talk to each other, we, we start to connect the dots. And this sounds very much like what you may have experienced or, or what a lot of families experience. This communication is from 1808, and it was actually describing polio, uh, what turned out to be poliomyelitis. And so we, we've been doing this for 200 years. And even with Google and machine learning and AI and Facebook and everything else, if we don't recognize what we're seeing and use the same language, we don't connect the dots for, for these events. And it's a, it's a real issue. So in um, the setting of uh, polio, so when we first saw these, as I mentioned, I had never seen a case of polio. So I called one of my colleagues who had actually uh, was older than me and had trained uh, for years in India. And I called him up and I described what we were seeing. And he said, Ben, this is polio. You literally just described polio with one major difference. And, and who here knows the major difference between what we're seeing now and polio? Clinically. So in, in polio, the most common limbs affected are the lower limbs, are the legs. And in acute flaccid myelitis, it's arms more than legs. You can have both, and there are exceptions. You can just have legs in acute flaccid myelitis today, but just statistically, there's a difference. We're going to come back to that as to why that's the case. But, yeah. Quick question. Are there any adult cases of AMA? Yes, there are. Okay. Um, so we are, my oldest in clinic is in uh, her 30s. And so we do, but it's just overwhelmingly statistically a pediatric condition. Uh, but there are adult cases, and I, I, I think. I'll show you some data later from public health and we collect some patients all ages. Okay. And, and so, but it raises an interesting question. So, for the CDC, which is different than the UK, and I actually agree with the way the UK public health is doing this, the CDC only wanted uh, cases reported if they were less than 21. So, when they were, so their statistics say 100% of cases are less than 21. <laughs> And I have a 35-year-old saying, have you reported me? And I say, well, they don't want to know about you, so no. Um, so it, it becomes this truism. As you set up case definitions, you exclude certain folks. So uh, polio uh, has been around for a very long time. So there are Egyptian hieroglyphics uh, uh, going back that describe a flaccid leg. You can see the difference between the two. And this looks to be consistent with a uh, single limb uh, lower motor neuron damage. This is the classic finding we'd see after an adult had had polio, and that's the 15th century BC. If you go back to treatises on, um, and I'm not just showing this because it comes from the Royal College of Physicians in London. I show this even when I'm in the United States. Descriptions of different diseases in polio which was described quite well uh, back even before we knew what the virus was. Uh, but ultimately, there was the ability to isolate a virus that was causing paresis in children uh, over those many hundreds of years. And so, uh, but it was actually extremely difficult to isolate the virus. And even to this day, if I take a spinal fluid from a patient who has polio, you can't isolate the virus from the spinal fluid. So the way we diagnose someone with polio is we get a stool sample and we find the virus in the stool in somebody who has weakness and we say, you have poliomyelitis. It's very difficult to get it out of the spinal fluid. When we look at the spinal cord, um, what you see is A is one of those lower motor neurons, the command and control center for wire number two. And in B, you have that command and control center that's lost its architecture and it's surrounded by these blue dots. So this was an infected anterior horn cell, one of those wire number twos, and the immune system is coming in to try and fight off the virus. And so what we know from polio very well is two things. 
Viruses can kill wire number two, and they can also elicit an immune response, which we think independently might do some damage, and we'll talk about that. So in the history, there were outbreaks all across uh, the world of um, cases of polio, and then as everybody here is aware, as you got to the 1920s, 1930s, and then into the 40s, there was a dramatic spike. This is data from the United States before and then after the very successful vaccination campaign, and we are very close to eradicating uh, uh, polio worldwide, um, and which will be a major achievement. Uh, what's interesting about this is why did this flip? So if you look at the curve, there's a couple things. One is there's an up-down. There are years there are cases, and there are years that there aren't. Sounds kind of familiar. And then what's got us all concerned is the right side. What changed to lead to, to outbreaks? And it's, a, it's just an interesting side story. Uh, so just for fun, I'll, I'll tell you. So the idea was that before, let me scoot back here, in, in years where there was very poor sanitation, and polio is a waterborne, or I should say a fecal oral exposure virus. And so if our hands aren't that clean, we can spread, if somebody's shedding the virus, you can spread it to an infant or a child and they can get affected with polio just through the oral route. Well, if they get their exposure as an infant while they're nursing, while they're breastfeeding, mom has antibodies to polio, so the virus is a little infection, but it's not that bad. It doesn't go full blown. They're protected by mom's antibodies but that exposure allows the infant to develop their own immunity. It's a vaccination, if you will. It's a safe exposure. Now, if you clean things up, such that during your infant years while breastfeeding, you don't get your own natural exposure, you never see the virus because sanitation is so good, by the time you're eight and nine, you don't have a protection against polio. So sanitation created a vulnerable population. So every time our infants dropped their pacifiers on the ground and we were hyper cleaning them and sterilizing them, we shouldn't. We should just shove it back in. <laughs> because during that year, they're protected from what we have and those exposures are great, uh, are, are quite helpful. And then with sanitation, we created a vulnerable population. And this is one of the reasons polio affected upper middle income over lower income first because it was the class that had a uh, sanitary living environment that were most affected by polio. And so it had to do with creating a vulnerable population is what led to the big outbreaks. And so, uh, as I said, we've mostly eradicated and the problem with eradicating polio in the United States is we stopped looking. So this is the graph of countries that do active surveillance for flaccid paralysis. And once polio went away in the United States, they said, why bother? We don't have polio anymore, so we stopped looking. So as each center saw one case, it was not notifiable to a health department. And so for a rare event in a population, we couldn't connect the dots until we got to 2014. And since 2014, this has been our, our clustering. In the US, we're July, August through November is our peak, and you'll hear the data for the UK. Uh, relative to peak cases. We had a clear outbreak in 2014. I love this slide, this is from the CDC. It starts August 14, so you say, well, that was the beginning of the outbreak. No, that was the beginning of surveillance and reporting. There's actually a lot of cases in July and June that don't make it into the numbers because their surveillance program wasn't set up. But we always start the graph here because that's the data they have. We didn't see it in 2015 or 17, and I can tell you we didn't see it in 2019. Uh, and so it is in every year. And so you look at this and you ask, well, what's causing this? Because we knew there were a lot of different diseases and this caused a lot of tension between practitioners, families, and, and the public health department in the United States because originally the public health department said, well, we're not gonna jump to conclusions. Uh, this could be anything. It could be exposures to lead. It could be exposures, could be genetic conditions. And I said, well, there really aren't outbreaks of genetic conditions, but put that aside. They were being very thorough, appropriately so, to try and make sure. And so when we looked at these clusters, what we found was during the exact same period of time in the U.S., there was circulating enterovirus D68. So this respiratory infection that went away during these periods and came back during the peaks. So it's pretty good circumstantial evidence, but it's still not absolute proof. So what do we know about enterovirus D68? 
So in the U.S., it's very hard to find it. So we, we've had surveillance programs for flu, taking swabs of kids as they come in with colds for years. So if you go back to the freezers and you look to see how many kids had this virus, you can't find any in the 1980s, 1990s. Very rare to see it. You see a little bit in the 2000s, and then the first big, uh, big is in relative terms, the first noticeable outbreak of it in a respiratory uh, arena in the U.S. was in 2009. Went away, it wasn't as prevalent, 10, 11, but then in 12, 14, 16, 18, every two years, same uh, point in time, we've seen large outbreaks. It's closely related to a rhinovirus, which is a common cold virus. It's a respiratory virus. The reason this is important, it's while enterovirus D68 is in the same family of viruses as polio, most viruses in that family cause GI illness. They cause diarrhea. Enterovirus D68 uh, prefers a different temperature, so it lives in the nasopharynx, it lives in the lungs, and it gives you a cold. And so some enteroviruses give you uh, a diarrhea, some give you a cold. Turns out that the one that gives you a cold led to a lot of neck inflammation. The enteroviruses that give you diarrhea led to a lot of inflammation in the lower spine. And so there was an anatomic separation based on what organ the virus affects and where paralysis occurs. What's really concerning about this is we have strains of the virus from the 1960s in the freezer. So enterovirus D68, we take it out of the freezer, we thaw it, we inject it in a mouse, nothing happens. If you take the 2014 strain out of the freezer, inject it into a mouse, they develop paralysis of that limb. And when you look at the mouse's spinal cord, they've lost wire number two. The virus goes in, affects those wires, and they die off. So they've done the genetic sequencing and the virus between the 1960s and 2009, 2014 mutated in several areas, leading to it being neurovirulent, uh, able to infect a neuron and lead to paralysis. And so it's not as if we were missing this, the enterovirus D68 was not doing this, that we can tell prior to 2009. And so when I looked back at our cases uh, prior to 2009, I really can't see this pattern. Uh, it really is something that was much more recognizable after 2009. So this is a very busy slide. I'm gonna test you on it later. So read all the numbers and over lunch, you'll have a little form you fill out. So uh, I just wanna point out a couple things that, that may be of interest. So these are the US cases through 2018. And the reason I'm gonna point out a couple trends is it really helps on the family side sort out why some things feel different than others. There's, there's a lot of similarity, but then some stuff doesn't make sense. For example, so if you look at the age, the median age, for everything between 2015 and, and 2018, uh, you would get a median age of, let's say, seven. But if you split it between even years and odd years, and if you assume the even year cases are, you have a unique cause, that's different than the odd year cases, the median age changes. The median age during the peak years is five, the non-peak years is eight. If you look at how you find enterovirus D68, in the odd years, we don't find it at all as a cause. We find a lot of other things. But if you isolate just the even years, over half the patients find it. And if you restrict these cases, to the children who were tested within three days of admission, because timing matters, this number goes well above 80%. If you wait a while before doing the swab, the virus is gone. Yeah? What was the best way of testing that? I think we did a nasal swab. Nasal pharyngeal swab is outpacing everything else. Yeah. We, we, so, we, so our public health uh, have requested both uh, stool samples, rectal swabs, and nasal swabs, because we're still looking for GI-based enteroviruses. So we do send both, but for enterovirus D68, it's almost always, and, and I'm, I'm sure you, uh, you'll speak to it on the UK side, we send nasopharyngeal swabs. But there's a difference between even years and odd years, what we're seeing. The next difference we see is when we look at 2016 and 2018. So when we restricted 2016 and we had more of the kids be, for whatever reason, being tested sooner, the enterovirus D68 was over 70%. And then when we look at just the even years, uh, and I think I skipped this on the other side, upper extremity and lower extremity involvement. So on the peak years, upper extremity only is a third. Now the rest of them, and lower extremity only is only 13%. The rest of them had both, upper and lower. 
but it flips in the non-peak years. In the non-peak years, the lower extremities are more common than the upper. There are different causes of acute flaccid myelitis, and when it's enterovirus D68, it has a unique pattern that is different than other viruses. And so as we're sorting out, so enterovirus D68 is not the only cause of acute flaccid myelitis. But if it, in the US, between July and November, on an even year, it is the most common cause by fourfold. And so finally, uh, if you look at, um, I, I'll leave that one out. So, so it was with this background in terms of the enteroviruses that our public health uh, group, uh, who are lovely, thoughtful, very dedicated people who I consider very close colleagues, uh, made a proclamation that I vehemently disagreed with. They said, if this is a virus, under no circumstances should you give steroids or do plasma exchange. And so this was happening before we had, this happened in 2014, before we had any outcomes data. We had none. They hadn't surveyed a single case. And this proclamation uh, came out. Um, and it caused a real problem for us. Because if, like polio, the virus can elicit an immune response that independently causes damage, I may not be able to do anything about the virus, but I might be able to do something about the inflammation. But as you can imagine, uh, so let's say, uh, and I don't want to bring you back to the dark days in the hospital, which is scary for everybody, but uh, sitting down with me in the hospital saying, I want to give your child steroids, and you say, well, I just Googled this, and the CDC has said under no circumstances should you give steroids, uh, I want a second opinion. And I say, you should definitely get a second opinion, uh, but I still want to give steroids. It, it created a lot of tension. So, what we did is uh, we looked backwards because what we um, uh, realized was we actually had some, some data on this. And I'm going to skip for a second. I'll come back to this. Uh, to what we call the conquer cohort. So I mentioned that we had our outbreak. So these are our children who just showed up to my hospital, my one hospital. Dallas, we were talking about the differences on the healthcare system side. So the Dallas Metroplex has around 7 million individuals and we have um, four major pediatric hospitals with over 600 beds each. And so kids can show up in a lot of different places in a small geographic area. And so even though we had a center dedicated to myelitis, not all transverse myelitis comes to our center. It can go anywhere. And so uh, in 2014, we said, you know, we really should look back. And indeed, we had seen AFM cases, but they were diagnosed as transverse myelitis plus syndrome, that ridiculous name. So what we did is before I knew about the CDC's edict, don't use steroids or plasma exchange, I had been using steroids and plasma exchange in all these kids. I didn't know I was doing something that would be proclaimed a bad idea. I thought I was doing a good thing, but it gave us data. So we looked back at over 30 cases, and this is very busy. I'll cut to the, the short part, which is the majority of kids had an outstanding outcome with steroids and plasma exchange. So 61% did extremely well. And when we compared deficits uh, relative to where the virus would have infected the cords, those kids weren't getting worse. So as we gave the steroids and plasma, and plasma exchange, a child who came in with one arm weak all of a sudden didn't develop multi-limb weakness. We weren't causing the virus to just escape and go rampant within the nervous system. Uh, we weren't, uh, at least to this, causing harm to the children. And so we felt confident that that proclamation was premature uh, in nature. And so when we looked at the outcomes relative to steroids and plasmapheresis, so 90% of the kids had gotten steroids, half had gotten plasmapheresis. And when we looked at the flaccid limb, it was a little better than 50-50 split of improvement versus not, meaning you could flip a coin. I couldn't tell that I was helping, but I couldn't tell that I was hurting things. But when you looked at the upper motor neuron limb, meaning weakness caused by wire number one damage, okay, so this is wire number two, I'm not sure I helped any of the wire number twos. I, I, don't, I honestly don't think I did. But when wire number one was affected at the same time, all of those children had significant improvement. So if we go back to the anatomy, so imagine the virus entering the neck, affecting wire number one, uh, excuse me, wire number two in the neck, and those cells are dying and arms are getting weak. As the immune system comes in and fights the virus, it can cause damage 
to the wire number ones right there, right next to it, that are on their way down to the legs. So we had kids with a flaccid arm, but different pattern of weakness in the legs. They were quadriplegic, but the weakness in the legs was being caused by inflammation, not by the virus. So when I treated that inflammation, we were able to get kids walking again. I'm not sure I helped the arm, is where we came down in terms of this data. And so at the same time, sure, uh, by happenstance, in 2013, we had been awarded a federal grant to study the outcomes of pediatric myelitis nationwide. And so we had set up a network of seven centers and an online cohort to collect data from families before the outbreak started of AFM. We were just doing a transverse myelitis study. So we had this whole network set up and it just happened to be there as the outbreak started occurring. So we collected data on outcomes and we looked at prospectively, not a chart review, what happened to kids with acute flaccid myelitis. Uh, this is my favorite slide of the whole talk. These are all the different treatments kids got. And depending on what hospital you went to dictated what you got. Some kids just got steroids. Some kids got plasma exchange. Some got I all three. Some got just IVIG. It, it was totally random. There's no science here. It was whatever your practitioner was comfortable with, that's what you got. So we looked at the outcomes the, relative to steroids and plasma exchange, again with this question of if we're causing harm, then we should see kids do worse who got steroids and plasma exchange versus not. And in this cohort, that's not what we saw. What we saw was for those, so standing up is just leg function. These are very gross uh, activities of daily living. Can you stand up from a chair and can you tie your shoes? So one's about your legs and one's about your hands. And so relative to standing up, for those who got steroids, the majority of them had a really good recovery, and it was only about half. If we look at the tying shoes, 90% of them had a good recovery with steroids, uh, and less than 50% had a poor recovery with steroids. If the steroids were causing harm, we would have expected the inverse of those things. Yeah? Is there any significance in the order and the timing that those treatments are given? I think we have different experiences as well. It's like to whether we got plex before IVIG or the other way around. And yeah. Like we always felt like he had plex first, partly because ours was the DXC had to go to a different hospital. We actually felt he effectively had plex before IVIG was again. So in this cohort. It cleans the blood out, right? So it's yeah, so whenever you give plasma exchange after IVIG, you just sucked out the IVIG. So, so we, yeah, so we, 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 We've done that before for the same situation. When we have children transferred to us who had IVIG but aren't responding, we just say, well, that was a waste and we do the plasma freezes. Uh, so it happens and it happens everywhere. Um, what I'm about to say is um, uh, anecdotal, not published, not a guideline. It's based on our center experience. Uh, for wire number one, and I'm only talking about that wire number one, so, so not the gray matter, but the wires going down that give you a tight weakness, we feel as though time to plasma exchange makes a difference relative to preserving those wires. So um, when in our institution, if a child comes in with a significant motor deficit that we think is due to wire number one, we do steroids and plasmapheresis simultaneously. Their plasmapheresis starts within 36 hours of admission. And so and, uh, our, the majority of our children who come in paraplegic are fully ambulatory uh, uh, down the line. So we, we're trying to collect the data. The problem is doing a prospective study, I've decided is impossible. Anu Jacob, I know, is, is leading a, an effort here in the UK around IVIG versus plasma exchange. I tried that study six years ago, and I walked into a lot of family rooms, and I said, we have a study where, if you agree, we're going to randomize your child to either IVIG or plasma exchange. There's data for both. They both might work. I believe in both. There are pros and cons. What do you say? And I got the same question from every family. If we don't do the study, what are you going to do? I said, well, if you don't do the study, I'm going to do plasmapheresis. And they said, no thanks on the study. Let's just do plasmapheresis. Because ethically, I have to reveal what I'm, I'm not going to do nothing for your child. And so we didn't enroll a single patient in five years. Yeah, I'm not surprised either. And so it's a very difficult study to do in any prospective fashion. So with this as a background in terms of the acute therapy, what do we do now kind of long term? And so I'm, I'm going to leave it to the uh, experts to go into details, but I'll give you a, a high-level sense of what we're doing uh, at my center. The first is 
We are really working with physios and with families and with kiddos to recognize that the weakness pattern in each limb is different. The way you rehabilitate a limb that's been affected by wire number one is different than rehabilitating a limb affected by wire number two. And often we have kids who have differences. So what their legs need is different than what their arms need. And what will work for the legs might not work for the arms and vice versa. So you have to separate that out. And one of the key things is recognizing how the body repairs. So let's talk about wire number one for a second. So you've cut the wire going from the brain to the spinal cord and you've cut it, you've transected that axon. How could I ever get back function? Well, if you have several million wires going down that tube, going all the way to the leg, and I cut 500,000 of them, the way you recover is by getting the other wires to learn how to take over the job, and they can. That's plasticity, and kids are insanely plastic. We can get their brains to mold in very different ways to take over for those lost axons. If you've cut wire number two, such that that muscle has far less of a connection to the spinal cord than it used to, you have to get whatever wires are left. So let's say there was 100,000 wires going to my biceps for wire number two, and I lose 80,000 of them. There's no way I'm gonna get the biceps to move. The 20,000 have to sprout new connections, and they do. We do this in a dish, we do it in animals, they can sprout. So instead of one wire controlling 10 muscle fibers, we need it to sprout to control 40 muscle fibers to start bringing back activation of the muscle. And it turns out, in our experience, uh, it may be different here, the repair pathways uh, don't speak English. So you can ask them, please sprout. And you can do that every day 10 times. They don't speak English. They don't speak Polish. Uh, French, we tried French, it didn't work. Um, uh, I'd love to say uh, prayer helps, I can't prove it. Uh, it turns out that the wires only speak one language and that's activity. So in, you don't have a genetic code as a human being to repair a damaged neuron. There isn't a gene that turns on that leads to sprouting. The only thing we can see that leads to sprouting is a need for sprouting. And so we focus on trying to get the muscles to move the way we want to send the signal to the neurons to sprout. And it is an incredibly slow process. So the patterns we're seeing, so I said I'd, I'd give you a sense over what we're seeing now more than six years out. I'm now more than 10 years out from our first eight cases is for the individuals who are really pushing on the rehab side, meaning every day something is happening. So we win the lottery, we all go to Fiji on vacation, even on the beach in Fiji, we're doing therapy. There isn't a vacation day from therapy. And it's, it's more, in our experience, the repetition rather than duration. So I tell my families, I'll take two five minute sessions in the day uh, over missing a day and having one hour session the next day. It's the every day. If your muscles don't get asked to move over and over and over again, they, they don't. Yeah. You said it's been time scale. So more time is better, uh, is just the honest answer, but it's not more time aggregated over a week. So repetition for us has been what we've recommended at a minimum. And then whatever we can layer on is great. So the key being, we don't want to go a day without something. Now, therapy means a lot of different things. There are, are games you play that are therapy. Therapy takes lots of different forms, but you, you want to consciously have something every day. Um, but what we're seeing in our cohort 10 years out is steady recovery. So we have, um, for our kids who are more than two years out, uh, everybody's off a ventilator. We don't have any... Uh, even the ones who are vent dependent through 18 months, we, we can push the diaphragm and get people to be off ventilators. Uh, people who've been plegic for three years of a limb, I'm now seeing some supination or some movement. Uh, and so uh, it's like watching grass grow. And, as you, and one of the key things that we found is water therapy because our kids will move in the water before they move on, gra on ground. I'm gonna have t-shirts made that say, gravity sucks. Uh, uh, because it really does. And when you take gravity out of the equation, you can start to see movements that we are completely unaware of. 
uh, uh, with gravity, and then repetition, 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 because what you're trying to do is, so there's one wire drawn here that's activating all those red dots. You want it to sprout and start to control the others. And as it picks up a new one, a new one, a new one, a new one, you transition for a year, a year and a half of not seeing anything happen and beating your head against the wall and saying, why am I doing this? Nothing's ever gonna change. Or being told in the US by your insurer, nothing's gonna change, stop going to therapy. And we have to fight that uh, because it can. And then the moment you get a critical mass of sprouting, then it can start to take off and you can work on different functions. I'm not gonna talk about neurotransfers, surgery, you're gonna hear a lot about that today. We are doing it in the US and I'm happy to share our experience, but uh, uh, I'll leave it to uh, the experts here. So um, the conclusions um, are, uh, it's pretty clear that if it's the right time of year, um, enterovirus D68 is the predominant cause of these outbreaks in the United States. And it looks like the same patterns happening uh, UK and Europe, and you'll hear the data. Um, half of our patients, and I didn't say this already, had both wire number one and wire number two affected. Half were just wire number two. So in half of our patients, there's a benefit from steroids, plasma exchange. That's my opinion. It's not an official statement yet. Uh, and so we really want to find those patients. And then obviously, we need to do the prospective studies. So in Dallas, uh, I'm very lucky to be surrounded by um, a team. So CONQUER, the acronym, uh, actually stands for Collaboration on Neuroimmunology, Question, Understand, Educate, Restore. That took three beers in California to come up with that uh, acronym, but we're, we're quite proud of what those three beers produced. I will say, and the reason I spell it out is uh, the first letter is collaboration. We would not have gotten where we got to without working with our families. Uh, it made all the difference for us to really connect the dots nationwide and really understand the different um, aspects of what was going on. Uh, we have a big group. We work with Lou's uh, counterparts in the US, the, the Transverse Myelitis Association, Chitrakrishan and Sandy uh, Siegel, uh, now the Siegel Rare uh, Neuroimmune Association. Uh, they've changed their name. Um, and I, I always end, whenever I give talks, I end with pictures of my uh, daughters. So when I started in the world of transverse myelitis, my two girls uh, were at this stage. Uh, now they're at this stage, uh, and I medicate on a regular basis to try and get through this stage. Now they're good kids, and I, as I said uh, with colleagues at a meeting in Belfast earlier, uh, they always ask me if I'm going to talk somewhere, what are you talking about? And uh, this one, the younger one, Hannah, last week uh, said, what are you going to London for? I said, well, I'm going to be talking about transverse myelitis and AFM. And she said, you haven't fixed that yet? I was like, oh, yeah. So you're not the only one giving us heck over uh, not getting this done yet. So I appreciate the invitation to be here uh, and um, happy to chat with you guys and take any questions you have. So I just wanted to ask, if you know, it falls at a certain time of year, if a set of siblings get the same cold, why is there only one of them got it Yeah, so it's a spectacular question. Um, there's a couple different answers to it. So, so the first and the honest answer is we don't know for sure. So that's number one. Uh, but from history, what we know is there's probably going to be three variables that dictate who in the family came down with AFM. So number one is going to be previous immunity. Had the other siblings been exposed to a virus similar enough such that they could prevent viral replication enough to keep it from going to the spinal cord? So they may have all gotten the same cold, but some kids may have had some protection. And, in, and so that may be one reason. Number, yeah? Sorry, just leading on from that, from what you said earlier, I was actually breastfeeding at that time, my youngest daughter, so could that potentially have prevented her? Yes, uh, that is a possibility. And secondly, we're doing a large genetic study in the United States to see if certain individuals are genetically predisposed to have the neurologic outcome that they did. So maybe their system handles the virus differently once it gets into cells. And then finally, third, could a virus uh, acquire one extra mutation in some people but not others, leading it to affect the nervous system? So we're trying to sort out all three of those different variables. As you can imagine, uh, in order to sort those out, it takes a large number of individuals, uh, their blood samples and their histories, uh, and nasal swabs and all of it to sort through it. And so uh, we've had to partner up with a lot of different groups. There's not going to be 
one center, and in the end, it's probably not gonna be one country that sorts that out. It's really gonna take everybody coming together, putting all of our data together to try and answer that question. You're on a talk show, you didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned that um, none of your kids are now on ventilators anymore. Uh, those who were vent dependent and are now more than two years yeah, out. Yeah, more than yeah. two years out, okay. Yeah. Um, is, is that a pattern you see uh, in other centers across the US? It's, it's variable. What I'm seeing is um, if we're working with pulmonary physicians, uh, lung doctors who are used to working with neuromuscular children, and they listen to us that this isn't a fixed deficit. So it's very different than a lot of the physicians were used to seeing children on chronic ventilators due to a degenerative condition, where once they went on the ventilator, they weren't going to get off. And so um, when we were working with uh, pulmonologists who were really more aggressive with weaning protocols, the number of kids getting off started going up. It's not universal. We still have kids who are more than two years out, more than four years out, still on a ventilator. But our number is shrinking, and we've looked at a variety of other ways to get them off. The um, team in uh, Baltimore uh, have worked on what's called diaphragmatic pacing, inserting a pacemaker to get the diaphragm to move, and a variety of other ways. Um, and we've had conversations about nerve transfer for it. It gets a little tricky uh, to do that. It's a very big, uh, complicated muscle. But um, most of the kids are coming off. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that was going to be my second question. Is there anything special that you guys are doing for rehab on the, the diaphragm and... Yeah, so, well, so the respiratory side, so both for uh, the vent and for swallowing, there's an, there's an interesting little pattern we saw in a lot of our kids, and that was they started developing a psychological aversion to lowering the vent settings or to trying to swallow. So especially if a child was quadriplegic, they can't move and they're on a ventilator, um, if they feel air hunger at all, it is a very anxiety-provoking event. So we'd have a couple kids where we had tried a couple times, it didn't go well, and then when we brought up trying to wean the vent again, they panicked. The, the kids were not going for it. And so we really had to bring in the psychology side of things to work on anxiety management and a lot of other things to give us a chance to very slowly. So we would, you know, without telling them, turn the vent setting down by one. You know, and just very slowly, uh, without telling the kids, we told the parents, just to be clear, uh, um, you know, very subtly make changes uh, to get them used to uh, the different settings. Same thing for swallowing. So we had some kids with impaired swallowing, uh, and then when they first went to try uh, uh, liquids or something thick and had a coughing episode, uh, they were panicked. I mean, because if, if I'm coughing, the first thing I do is bring my arms up to my head and I move and all these things. And you're just, if you're just stuck, it's a very anxiety. So it, we really brought in, again, psychology to work with the kids on getting over the anxiety to try things. And the breathing and the swallowing, I think, follow the same pattern that we're seeing in the limbs. You have to ask the muscle to improve in order for it to improve. If you have a machine doing all the work of breathing, why would you ever sprout? So you have to stress out the muscle, but that muscle, uh, you're going to feel it. You're, you're going to have air hunger. And so it really is a delicate balance between uh, moving through but not traumatizing our, our kids. Well, it's quite a different st stressing a, an arm muscle to stressing one that you need to stay alive. Right? Exactly. And, and the brain knows it and the brain feels it. And so there, there's a real reluctance. So... Uh, Puppies are really helpful. So we bring in dogs and try and distract the kids with puppies while we're changing vent settings. And so if they're distracted with this, and I mean that seriously. Any, any type of distraction when we're playing with vent settings goes a long way. Uh, okay, so you could stress, a, 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 I guess, a bicep or something by actively moving an, a, an arm. And that's relatively easy to imagine. Um, but if you've got sort of our, our son developed in the right arm and then and this sort of went almost the secondary to the, to the right side of the diaphragm, so the phrenic nerve. So how do you stress the diaphragm? Is, that, is the vent doing that, or is there another activity you should be doing to, to speak the language for the muscle of the diaphragm to move so that you might sprout some more? Because I guess for him, in, post, in our personal case, that's it, it's still the biggest issue. The arm is obviously not great, but 
breathing is much more yeah. effective to his daily life. So is it what can you do to stress the diaphragm? So it, it's about taking deep breaths. I mean, it sounds really silly, but, but that's literally uh, the exercise for the diaphragm. And when, you, when you're taking relatively shallow breaths, which is what we're all doing right now when you're sitting comfortably, your diaphragmatic movement isn't that much. You're getting a lot of that from other muscles of the chest. You don't have to expand your chest that much. You know, when they talk about kind of relaxation and yoga and the deep breaths where you really now, that's when you get really big movement and big chest expansion. That's technically, I mean, I, 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 I would think something. I suggest lots of new games like blowing into a water, getting a straw and just blowing into it so that you can get bubbles and colors and stuff like this. You can also use balloons to, or cotton wools and a small balloon to just blow blow them away you know, through those kind of games. You could also do actually arm activities. That would also open it up. So you could just do bilateral arm games. Um, tennis he's, or he's just on the right. He is um, all based off the bed at night. Like he can go through the night without the bed. He's not going to say it's all the day now. Um, yeah. Because we're back in February. Well, yeah, that, and also because his CO2 is just a little bit too high. Right. Like, we're almost there. We've almost, like, three yeah. and a half years ago, so we've kind of been through a lot of respiratory. You could just do this kind of stuff during the day with him, I yeah. guess, so he would feel a bit more confident in himself. But I, I, the, I think the problem we have is because it's the right side doesn't move, it's that paradoxical movement. So we had a VF done of his diaphragm mm -hmm. last week, and it's just, it's... When, you know, the right, the, the, because the right side is not moving normally, it almost hampers the left because it moves in that sort of paradoxical mm -hmm. way. So. And, yeah. and so when it's one side, it is a little harder. It's, it's, it's hard to isolate a diaphragm. Yeah. You, you could work, and I, I'd have to talk uh, both with physio and PT in terms of the positioning you can do. I, I'm imagining really collapsing the left side, so really leaning to the to left, right and side. then take yeah. the deep breath where that most of your volume would be on the right. But essentially, you're trying to, as much as possible, isolate a right diaphragm and yeah. get it to expand. And yeah. it's all one muscle. Anyway, yep. yeah, someone else? Okay. Um, relapse. Is there any cases you've come across where they relapse again? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question. And I'm going to answer that and one you didn't ask so I can get out ahead of it. So uh, number one is I am not aware of any documented relapses of new inflammation, not a single one. There have been recurrences of symptoms, so prior symptoms transiently getting worse. So a day or a week where the leg, which had been recovering, isn't functioning as well. But when investigated, we could find no new inflammation, and all those kids went very rapidly back to their baseline. And there's probably a reason that they had that transi uh, transient worsening of symptoms. Uh, so the short, the short answer is no. Uh, we are not seeing relapses, uh, and this now goes back all the way to the 2009 outbreak. So we have 11 years, zero relapses that we can document. And I'll add on, and this is the one you didn't ask, but I'm gonna get out ahead of it, is all of our kids are back on their vaccination schedule and we haven't seen a single relapse post-vaccination. So, and that includes flu vaccine, uh, everything. And so we have been very confident in just plowing ahead. What we have seen in our kiddos who didn't get flu vaccine, who got flu, uh, is a high rate of ICU admissions relative to flu. And so we've been very proactive about getting the kids. I know it's a controversial issue, uh, but I always take the opportunity to share our experience uh, that we haven't had a single recurrence as kids got back on the vaccine schedule. We have had um, a couple of times where he hasn't where he hasn't been able to walk, but it does resolve, and it's usually because he's had a cold, just a normal cold or yeah. something like that. And it's, and it's the fine. walking, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the walking. Yeah. yeah. So there's something called UTOS yeah. phenomenon. So in the setting of a systemic illness, it, and this is um, almost always when wire number one has been affected, in a systemic illness or anything that increases body temperature, yeah. and so playing really hard, getting body temperature up, transiently uh, the signal doesn't get through that wire number one. So wire number one was damaged but repaired, mm. but the repair isn't as good as the original and it's temperature mm. sensitive. So in the setting of illness, the old symptoms will come back, yeah. but then as you get over the illness, it goes away. And it does. It, it causes a lot of concern for families, uh, but we haven't seen a single recurrence. We did. We took him back into A&E, and he had an MRI, but he was perfectly fine. So. Yeah.